I'm Ann Jones. I'm a registered vascular technologist, a registered nurse, and a registered diagnostic medical sonographer. I'm a clinical instructor of neurology at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, and I'm here today to discuss transcranial anatomy and transcranial Doppler clinical applications. Transcranial Doppler was introduced by Rooney Oslid in 1982 and clinically viable in 1986. It was first utilized for the evaluation of vasospasm following subarachnoid hemorrhage, and it is a non-imaging pulse Doppler technique, and it is velocity driven. Now the velocities evaluated with transcranial Doppler are the time average mean of the maximum because Dr. Oslid felt that this more accurately reflected brain perfusion there was no angle correction required, and we assumed an angle of incination of 0 to 15 degrees. Transcranial Doppler imaging was introduced in 1990 through the use of an adapted 3 MHz cardiac transducer. Clinical applications and technologies continue to emerge for transcranial Doppler, and portability remains crucial because of the clinical applications. Who uses transcranial Doppler in practice? Well, primarily there are two groups, pediatric hematologists who identify patients at risk of stroke with sickle cell anemia. It is considered the standard of care for these patients between the ages of six months and 16 years, and it assesses the impact of management with transfusion therapy. Neurosurgeons use ICU in the intensive care unit to assess vasospasm following subarachnoid hemorrhage. They monitor the rise in mean flow velocity and implement therapy based on these changes. The speed and severity of vasospasm is predictive of outcome. Other clinical applications that may not be as widely utilized are seen here. Now in your own clinical practice, you may want to go to your neurologists, surgeons, interventionalists, and hospitalists to see if there are very specific utilizations that would work in your clinical setting. Neurologists evaluate patients with stroke, head injury, carotid stenosis, and suspected intracranial stenosis. They also evaluate the impact of carotid stenosis on intracranial flow. Surgeons often use TCD for interoperative monitoring for emboli detection and to make sure that the MCA is patent. Interventionalists will monitor the middle cerebral artery recanalization after TPA and they will also assess stent placement, and hospitalists use continuous intracranial monitoring in the ICU to assess cerebrocirculatory arrest. The basic concepts of TCD are here. The basic principles, you use a 1 to 2 megahertz pulse Doppler. Low frequency is necessary for incination through the bone. A bidirectional pulse Doppler is necessary to discriminate flow direction and sample volume depth and the diagnosis is based primarily on spectral waveform using, again, the time average mean of the maximum velocity. The instrumentation for transcranial Doppler really applies to the application that you're using. Non-imaging Doppler systems have been the established standard since 1986. They are portable, they're reliable, and the exams are repeatable, but the learning curve is, is quite significant. And of course, there is no image to guide the placement of the sample volume. Color Doppler imaging Im has emerging as an, as an optimal technology for monitoring intervention because you can actually visualize and assess MCA occlusions and other issues. Both are still relevant. Both still have very specific utilization. The instrumentation needs will vary with the clinical setting and the application, as previously mentioned. Portability is very helpful because you're often going to the operating room, the emergency room, to the patient's bedside, and in some cases you can travel to remote clinical sites for sickle cell screening. A fixed transducer is useful for monitoring so that you can actually attach the transducer to the patient's head using a headband and continuously monitor the middle cerebral artery. <clears throat> Imaging and color flow are optimal for monitoring interventional procedures or following the injection of thromb thrombolytics. The absence of a signal could indicate occlusion or poor alignment, so the non-imaging technique was difficult for these uses and imaging is optimal. Protocols are required for all clinical applications and they will be discussed 
So before attempting a transcranial Doppler or transcranial Doppler imaging, you must have a good knowledge of the intracranial anatomy. We are assessing the arterial vascular ring at the base of the skull known as the circle of Willis. The circle of Willis joins the two internal carotid systems with the vertebrobasilar system. It is the most important source of intracranial collateral circulation and is the primary focus of transcranial Doppler. Now to assess the circle of Willis, you must insinate the bone. There are three windows or access areas that are routinely utilized. The temporal bone, where you can insinate the middle cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery, the internal carotid artery terminal branch, and the posterior cerebral artery. The orbit provides visualization of the ophthalmic artery and the carotid siphon. So you can actually track the ophthalmic artery through the natural opening of the eye and uh, track it to its origin at the area of the internal carotid or the S-shaped curve of the carotid siphon. It is important if you are doing the orbital view to lower the power settings because you no longer have to go through the bone. The foramen magnum is another opening um, at the base of the skull and again you can lower the power a bit but because you require significant depth penetration to assess the basilar artery, uh, power levels are usually kept at about 50%. The first step in doing a transcranial Doppler is finding a signal. So you must insinate through the bone, determine which window you will be utilizing, and then tracking the intracranial vessels. So you position the Doppler sample volume um, at the, at the uh, inter initially at the middle cerebral artery, um, and it is really suggested that you place the sample volume at approximately the area that you would anticipate finding the terminal portion of the internal carotid where it bifurcates into the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery because this area is rich with vascular flow and you can usually get a good signal in this area. In the color flow when you place the the transducer at the skull, you look at the in intracranial uh, reflections from the B-mode image, and if you can see the uh, inner table of the contralateral skull, you know that you have an adequate signal. You would then turn on the color so that you could document the anatomy of the middle cerebral, anterior cerebral, contralateral, anterior cerebral, and contralateral MCA, and then looking posteriorly, you can get the top of the basilar and visualize the posterior cerebral artery, um, ipsilateral, and contralateral. So color is very helpful in this area. You then, of course, would place the sample volume within the vessels to document their time average mean to the maximum flow. So how are vessels identified with transcranial Doppler? There are several parameters. The window that you use to insinate, or the insination window, and that is the temporal, the orbital, or the suboccipital. The sample volume depth. So the depth will help us determine uh, the level where the flow is being evaluated, and the flow direction is very helpful in vessel identification. The probe angle is also useful because as you can see, you can angle completely straight on at the anterior circulation, and if you angle posterior laterally and a little inferiorly, you can pick up the posterior cerebral arteries and the top of the basilar. Now the traceability of vessels is very important. The middle cerebral artery is the longest and straightest vessel, so it is the most traceable. But the audio signal gives you very helpful information and can help you optimize the waveform just by using your ears to know that you have the sample volume placed within the middle of the vessel. The spectral waveform and velocity appearance are very important and this is where we focus most of our energy. As you look at the spectral waveform display, it may not look optimal to you, but there are very important pieces of information displayed here. First of all, we see that the flow is, that is displayed above the baseline is moving towards the transducer, and usually your systems will demonstrate some form of letting you know where you have forward and reverse flow. Obviously, with the color flow, you can demonstrate that with the color bar. In addition, you will see that the scale setting is quite high. And when you anticipate that you're going to find disease, particularly in vasospasm or, or sickle cell anemia, it's good to have the color bar maximized and to lower your baseline so that you can fully display the entire waveform and uh, not cut off the peak so that you're not acquiring the best information.
It is also important to have the color follower tracking the outline of the waveform very carefully so that it is picking up flow information and it is not picking up background noise. Now you can see in this image that there is some background noise and we do this because a little bit of background noise indicates that you have got the proper gain setting to be sure that you have acquired all of the useful signals and information for calculating the time average mean of the maximum. So optimization of the waveform not only means positioning the sample volume within the vessel to get the strongest signal, but also displaying it so that you can uh, calculate an accurate mean. The spectral waveform is crucial, and we do focus on this significantly because it is the basis for determining whether a, a, a study is normal or abnormal. So you optimize the signal with the best sample volume placement, and you can see that, if you're, that your sample volume is actually larger than the vessel in most cases. We generally use a 6 to 8 millimeter sample volume in vessels that are sometimes as small as 2 to 4 millimeters. So the sample volume completely encases the vessel if you have it placed properly. This ends up showing you a spectral display that is completely filled or somewhat broadened because you are sampling across the entire vessel. The envelope follower is very critical and if the envelope follower is picking up a lot of random signals in the background then you will not end up with an accurate mean flow calculation. The best quality spectral display with the minimum back background noise is optimal and the scale must display the entire spectrum. Why emphasize TAM? Well, the clinical management is determined by the numbers. So failure to optimize at every step may result in misidentification of vessels or failure to identify the highest velocity. So once you find a signal that is abnormal, you need to spend a great deal of time optimizing the signal and making sure that you have captured several waveforms so that you can use the, the highest velocity and the strongest signal to make your decision. Now, it's not just all about peaks and means, it's about the quality of the signal as well, because when you get into um, high flow states and distal to high flow states, you have the same characteristics as you do in other vessels. You have a damping of the waveform, you have turbulent flow, and all this information is very helpful. <coughs> Now this is a typical um, TCD waveform, and this is the kind of thing we like to see. You can see that, that the gain setting is high enough to completely fill in the spectral display. The envelope follower is carefully following the entire outline of the vessel, and there is a little bit of background noise indicating that you have set the proper gains to optimize your signal. Color Doppler adds assurance to spectral acquisition and it maps the anatomy. And this certainly to new users is very helpful because you can visualize the information you are trying to, sit, to evaluate and then place the Doppler sample volume at discrete points along the vessel. Now it is important not to just drop the sample volume at one or two places but to clearly track across the whole vessel because very small movements in these small vessels can cause you to miss something that could be important. Again, uh, making your diagnosis based on a beautiful spect spectral waveform display. Protocols are fundam fundamental in most uh, imaging procedures, but very critical in TCD, especially in pediatric patients because they have small heads, small vessels, and very small changes in the angle of the transducer can actually cause you to pick up a different vessel. So protocols provide consistency, they provide repeatability, and reliability. And when we're doing serial evaluations and we're monitoring the impact of therapy, repeatability is crucial. So a standardized technique means that you, have a, you can acquire objective data, objective numbers, and make decisions. You can come to a well-defined endpoint, and the management then is based on objective numbers. Protocols and technique are specific to the type of exam that you're performing. So even though there are certain fundamentals that are always acquired when you're doing a TCD, you may adjust your protocol and your technique based on what the clinical question that's being asked. What are the presenting symptoms of the patient? Do other vascular studies provide information? It is helpful to be able to look at an extracranial carotid study or a CT or an MR or an angiogram. Um, this isn't cheating. This is helping acquire all of the data to make the right diagnosis. Is the study part of an interventional procedure? If it is, you may decide you want to use imaging as opposed to non-imaging. Can you acquire a baseline exam for reference? This is really important when you're doing uh, daily monitoring. 
when you initially start a, on a patient, it's very helpful to be able to do a bilateral exam and then determine if you need to do a complete exam in the future. Is the study going to be bedside in the OR, ICU, ER, or vascular lab? This may determine which, which machine you use. And also, it's also helpful to use the same machine for follow-up exams so that you're sure that you are measuring the, the data the same way each time. Is the examiner experienced or are they new? We found that using transcranial imaging is very helpful for new folks because it helps them visualize the anatomy and get comfortable with the um, evaluation. Now in performing transcranial Doppler in adults, we do have expected depths and time average means and the maximum velocities. And as you can see, there is a bit of a hierarchy of flow. The middle cerebral artery, again, as I mentioned, is the longest straightest vessel, carries about 80% of the flow, and so we would expect it to have the highest mean velocity. The average depth from the, back, from the side of the skull is 30 to 65 uh, millimeters, so in this area you have a long traceable course. The anterior cerebral artery carries the next highest velocity of uh, volume of flow velocity, and that's 50, and then as you go down. The reason I point this out is that if you see an, an alteration in this hierarchy scheme, and you see that the internal carotid or the posterior cerebral artery have a higher mean flow velocity than the middle cerebral, then that would make you think I need to look more carefully. Have I insinated the wrong vessel, or is the posterior cerebral artery carrying a great deal of collateral flow, and is something going on in the middle cerebral artery? So these baseline expected depths and numbers are useful in helping you evaluate both normal and abnormal patients. Now factors impacting collateral flow also need to be remembered. If you have a proximal or distal stenosis, you're going to have the same type of waveform changes that you have seen in other vessels. If there's arterial narrowing, in, such as in vasospasm, in stenosis, or in focal diameter reduction, such as sickle cell anemia, you will have the same increased velocity. If you have an arterial na narrowing, such as vasospasm, stenosis, or focal diameter reduction, such as sickle cell anemia, you will have a predictable increase in, in mean flow velocity at the area of narrowing, and then you'll have a predictable waveform changes distal to that. If there is occlusion, you want to make sure that you have insinated both sides of the patient's head, try to demonstrate flow in the other vessels to make sure that you have got a good window and it's not just a technical problem, and you may decide that you want to, um, to use a different type of equipment to evaluate that, such as an imager. Changes in CO2, um, we have seen in evaluating patients, the children who are, were doing sickle cell anemia studies, that if they go to sleep and their CO2 increases, that they can actually increase their mean flow velocity. Now you may say, well, it's good to have a sleeping child. Well, it's not when you're trying to use the numbers to ob objectively decide which category of disease these children will be placed in, which will impact their management. So if they go to sleep and they make their CO2 go up, they will actually, you will actually see a rise in the mean flow velocity. As we know, flow velocity decreases with age, so the normal values that you would see in an 80-year-old would not be the same as the normal values you would see in a 40-year-old. And in head injury, there are other factors that will impact the intracranial flow. So what are some of the common clinical applications of TCD? And there are many applications. I'm going to focus on the ones that you will probably most routinely encounter in your clinical setting. Ruptured intracranial aneurysm and vasospasm following hemorrhage was the first and is still one of the standard uses of TCD. It was the first clinical application, and it is because annually in the United States we see over 30,000 ruptured intracranial aneurysms. Half of those patients die within minutes, and for those that do get to the hospital, um, it is very important to be able to uh, treat them and monitor them. The location of the aneurysm uh, of the vasospasm is based on the exposure of the arteries to the blood leakage in the brain, and they most commonly occur in the um, anterior cerebral artery, the internal carotid, and the middle cerebral. Although we do see from this slide that we do have um, aneurysms in the posterior circulation and the basilar artery. The hemodynamics of vasospasm, what's happening is that the body is attempting to maintain flow volume, and therefore they have to increase the flow velocity to deliver the blood flow to the brain. The elevated velocity often precedes the onset of neurologic symptoms, and this is very helpful because then the, the management of the patient can be changed so that the medications, the volume of, of fluids that they're getting will help maintain perfusion.
the velocity data directly impacts the management decisions and uh, the st study is usually required every 24 hours in these patients. An abrupt increase in flow velocity from one day to the other indicates a poor outcome. And you can see that normally when we do TCDs, we will actually track the, mean, the highest mean flow velocity that we acquire and we will do it on either a chart, a flow chart, something like a temperature chart in the patient's uh, chart so that the physicians can see the changes over time. The vasospasm protocols and criteria are pretty specific. Um, the, the maximum velocity is usually reached at about 7 to 12 days. It tends to resolve over three weeks, although I have actually seen patients at six-week follow-ups and they still had elevated velocities. Mild vasospasm is considered at 100 to 120 centimeters per second. Moderate is greater than 120 to 200, and severe is greater than 200 centimeters per second. And here there is a risk for ischemia. A rapid increase or greater than 25 centimeters per second rise per day is indicative of a poor outcome. Now the exam protocol is fairly specific. You will initially perform a complete baseline study, the right and the left, identify the highest velocities, and then when you do your monitoring daily, you may just be able to perform a unilateral study, whatever is indicated in that particular patient's setting. Now many of these patients have had their aneurysm clipped, so they'll have a surgical site and you will need to use sterile technique. It's helpful to notify the nursing staff when you will be coming, so if there's going to be a dressing change, it can be done after your study. And the TCD or the TCDI, you can use um, either one, but just make sure that you use the same equipment for follow-up exams. In the evaluation of pediatric patients with sickle cell anemia, transcranial Doppler has made a significant difference not only in their evaluation, but in their management. Now, there are focal TCD velocities because sickle cell anemia creates changes in the arterial anatomy with focal areas of narrowing, which impacts flow in a manner similar to what we see in atherosclerotic narrowing. There's potential for thrombotic or ischemic events in these patients. Patients with sickle cell anemia have distorted red blood cells and chronic hemolytic anemia. So when you think of anemia, you think of viscosity and you think of flow. So normally in these patients, they will actually have a higher normal mean flow velocity than you see in other uh, patients without sickle cell anemia. Cerebral infarction associated with occlusive vasculopathy, vasculopathy of the distal internal carotid artery and the middle cerebral artery is common. Stroke prevention is possible through chronic transfusion therapy and now other um, drugs are being evaluated as well. So what we will do is monitor the intracranial velocities with transcranial Doppler uh, as a screening tool when they're being treated and, um, and until they reach the age of about 16. Now one of the initial landmark studies for uh, evaluating children with sickle cell anemia was the stroke prevention trial in sickle cell anemia or the STOP trial. The STOP trial enrolled 130 children between the ages of 2 and 16 years. They were at a high risk of stroke if the mean velocity in the middle cerebral or the distal internal was greater than 200 centimeters, centimeters per second on two uh, positive exams. So we would perform one exam and then repeat it within about a two-week segment. Randomization for transfusion therapy or standard care occurred. After one year, 10 children in the standard care group had had, had a cerebral infarction and only one child who was receiving transfusion therapy. A clinical alert from the NIH recommended that transfusion therapy uh, to maintain a hemoglobin S below 30 percent. Now the pediatric exams have very specific issues. The children are young, they, um, and young children have the highest velocities normally. They are usually anemic. The low hematocrit and viscosity um, means that you have to have two times the volume of flow to deliver the same level of oxygen. So minor, and also minor changes in CO2, as I previously mentioned, will impact the velocity as well as the waveform shape. So you have to make sure your children aren't falling asleep and the velocities are drifting higher. They need to be in a steady state, meaning that they don't need to be in the midst of a sickle crisis. They need to have no fever. Um, and although it is tempting to perform studies on these children when they're in the hospital because you can, have a, you can get access to them, it is better to do them in a steady state. Um, in addition, it is important to 
remember that performing a study on a child with sickle cell anemia uh, means that you are looking at a very small head and the vessels are small and, um, and not separated greatly from the anterior to the posterior. So it's important to know in order to predict the level of the bifurcation and the depth of the vessels, we find it's helpful to do a bitemporal head diameter. And we actually get these from, the, from folks that do eye exams, and we actually measure right in, front of the, um, right in front of the ear and do a bitemporal measurement. And what this tells us is that we know then where the midline is because we divide the bitemporal diameter by two, and we also know that the uh, intracranial bifurcation is usually about 10 millimeters from the midline. And this is very helpful when we're doing the exam. Now the examiner for doing the TCD is usually sitting at the head of the bed with access to the instrument and the patient. And the reason we do this is that these can be long exams, so it's good to be comfortable and have your arms resting at the head of the bed. It's also to have good access to your little patient's head, make sure that they're not moving and that you can see them completely throughout the exam. You need to be com comfortable and in a quiet room, and although a quiet room often makes the children go to sleep, sometimes we'll actually do videos so that it'll keep them focused. Explain the procedure to the patient, measure the head diameter, and record the head diameter. Keep the child awake. The sample volume size that we routinely used in the STOP trial was six millimeters, and we would initially set the scale to display peak velocities of 250 centimeters per second so that we could display the entire waveform and get a good uh, mean velocity calculation. We would usually begin the exam at a depth of about 50 because that's where we anticipate the bifurcation and we have a high probability of getting a good quality signal at that depth. Search until the strongest signal is found, save the, and then uh, step the sample volume out and track through the entire course of the vessel. So we'll usually begin the study at about 36 millimeters and track until we get to the midline. Save the waveforms at two to four millimeter increments so that you make sure you are staying in the vessel, you are tracking the vessel and not moving out of that vessel. All exams are bilateral and the highest vessels are recorded in all, the highest velocities are recorded in all vessels. And this is just an example of how we would track and save all of the intracranial velocities. You can see any changes and then you can go back and recapture signals that you may think are not optimal. Now the sites of intracranial narrowing in pediatric sickle cell are the distal internal carotid and the proximal MCA. So the numbers that we use for, um, for categorization apply only to these vessels. So TCD exam for sickle cell, they're small arteries. We're, we're evaluating what I call moving targets or squirmy little children. So you have to stick to a very strict protocol. You must avoid false positives and false negatives because it will either mean that they withhold treatment or they provide treatment unnecessarily and the results actually change the management. So you want to track the entire course as previously mentioned. You also want to do evaluations of the posterior cerebral artery and the top of the basilar, again, noting the, the midline. You will do two measurements from the posterior, um, uh, eva uh, from the posterior uh, evaluation through the frame and magnum, and we do not routinely use ophthalmic evaluations in sickle cell protocols because we found that the children really did not like the uh, transducer being placed over the eye. We also found that it did not provide uh, significant additional information. So the interpretation of transcranial Doppler for the st stroke protocol protocol for stop. The mean flow velocity in the MCA or the ICA less than 170 centimeters per second was classified as normal. So usually between 140 and 170 is normal for these children. Mean flow velocity greater than or equal to 170 um, is considered conditional and mean flow velocity greater than or equal to 100 was considered abnormal. All abnormal findings had to be documented on two separate occasions. So it's important to never compromise in these studies because it really does impact the patient's future. Other clinical applications of transcranial Doppler, I'm going to just, step, uh, just uh, touch on very briefly. Acute stroke intervention and TCD monitoring of the MCA. Um, we know that uh, TPA must be administered within three hours. It is a very short window, so you will probably be called emergently to the emergency room or the um, stroke ICU. You, it's helpful if you can do a bilateral TCD initially just to document that you have good temporal wind windows, that you, have, uh, a flow, that you can document the flow pattern and the direction of the circle of Willis vessels. Um, the reason that we try to do both sides is that you do want to document that you have a good window and that you're not 
seeing an absence of flow just because it's a technical issue. Position the sample volume in the area of the middle cerebral artery during uh, the uh, administration of the, uh, the TPA and monitor at that same depth throughout the evaluation. Recanalization is indicative of early recovery. Persistent arterial occlusion, as you can see, bears a poor prognosis. This is one area where the um, imaging is really very helpful. You will probably want to um, set your frame rate and your, um, your uh, gain so that you can optimize the quality of the signal and, um, and make sure that you do not miss small changes in the flow um, as you're trying to monitor. Again, of course, it's very helpful to have the waveform information and monitor the change in the mean flow velocities over time. TCD monitoring, uh, one of the key uses is for emboli detection and um, a lot has been written about this in the literature and really it boils down to the fact that you must have four key figures. Uh, the um, signal must be transient and brief and less than 300 microseconds. The signal amplitude is greater than three decibel higher than the background. It must be a unidirectional Doppler signal, and it must be accompanied by an audio characteristic, which is uh, often a, a snap, a chirp, or a moan, and it is most frequently seen in patients with carotid stenosis, who may be embolizing prosthetic cardiac valves, or PFOs. And this is the type of signal that you would see with emboli. Now this is quite massive and um, it is really almost a chaotic type of signal that you see with all of these emboli flooding through the area of the middle cerebral artery. Often there's aliasing, of course. Or you may have a variety of high intensity signals where you just get an occasional chirp or um, in, uh, the, the high intensity um, or the hit um, in the waveform. You can see that you have the middle cerebral artery waveform being displayed here and then the hit is quite prominent. Now for intracranial stenosis, if this is the only reason that you're doing TCD, you're going to be disappointed because you will not see it all that often. But um, again, it is one of the areas where we have an absolute velocity criteria is not reliable due to variables of age, hematocrit, and vessel size. However, generally the mean of 80 centimeters per second in the middle cerebral artery, ACA, PCA, or distal internal are cause for concern and would probably warrant uh, uh, other um, assessments with other procedures. Greater than 100 centimeters per second in the middle cerebral artery is highly predictive of uh, greater than 50 percent stenosis. Stenosis. stenosis is most likely to occur at the siphon, that S-shaped curve of the internal carotid artery, the distal internal carotid where it bifurcates, and the middle cerebral artery. A focal increase of 25% um, is suspicious of stenosis as compared to the proximal and distal areas and the contralateral side. Now this again is a waveform we've seen before, but it demonstrates what we would expect to see in a stenosis, um, baseline uh, high amplitude signals, a weaker high, um, the high, high velocity signals, um, and an overall um, increase in velocity, a mean of 176 centimeters per second. Now when you have extracranial disease, uh, many neurologists like to use the TCD to evaluate what they call the impact of, of carotid stenosis. If you have a hemodynamically significant lesion in the neck, you want to see if it's actually impacting flow intracranially, if there are adequate collaterals, and if the patient is compensating. So once you've seen something like this, you would then go and do the intracranial assessment and frequently we will see something like this where we have a demonstrable uh, change in mean flow velocity from the ipsilateral or the affected side and the contralateral side. You would then look for the source of collaterals using your, um, your entire TCD study to see the uh, flow directions, to see any changes in the hierarchy. In this case, you can see that probably the anterior cerebral artery would be higher than the middle cerebral artery on the affected side. In addition, you might expect to see a flow reversal so that you have a cross filling from the right to the left. Um, in these patients, you also frequently see increased flow in the posterior cerebral artery. So in summary, the TCD impacts patient management in vasospasm, sickle cell anemia, monitoring and intervention. Um, evolving applications complement extracranial studies. The non-imaging TCD has clear applications with standardized technical and interpretation protocols, and imaging techniques are very effective in most applications. Now I'm going to actually move into a quick um, summary of how to perform a TCD protocol exam for sickle cell anemia patients. This protocol can actually be adapted to other procedures, but it is very specific for just the children with pediatric, uh, pediatric patients with sickle cell anemia.
Again, the, the head diameter needs to be measured before you do the study. It helps in, in helping you figure out the vessel depths and it aids in, in vessel identification. There are many bidirectional signals in um, intracranially, so this helps identify the depth of the midline and um, helps the interpreter of the study as well as the examiner um, decide which, which bifurcation means what, and I'll show you examples as we move forward. The ICCA bifurcation is generally 10 millimeters from the midline, so it's a good reference point. When you get lost when you're doing the study, you always go back to the bifurcation to help you get grounded, figure out where you are, and continue to move forward. In the pediatric TCV protocol, we record all waveforms. We figure it is better to have more information than, than less information, and uh, frequently if you see a signal and the, and the child becomes uncooperative, you may not get it again, so it's always important to to save every signal. Now we will initially begin by looking at the area of the anticipated bifurcation where you would usually have your strongest signal. It'll help you optimize what is your best temporal window and then track the, the sample volume depth out so that you're sure that you have traced the course of the middle cerebral artery, that you haven't gotten confused and, and you're tracing the posterior cerebral artery and it's carrying collateral flow. So the reason that we do all of these vessels is to differentiate that you've been in the anterior circulation as opposed to the posterior and and that you have clearly tracked the most suspicious vessel, which would be the middle cerebral and the termination of the internal carotid. So you begin at 50 at the bifurcation, step out, and then begin to track from about a depth of about 38 to 50 millimeters following the entire course of the middle cerebral artery. The bifurcation, you will have a bidirectional waveform um, demonstrating the middle and the anterior cerebral. The anterior cerebral artery will have flow towards the midline, so it'll have flow as away from the transducer. And the distal internal carotid, because of its position and its angle, it is suboptimal for Doppler evaluation and you will have to actually angle inferiorly to be able to get that distal internal carotid and so you will end up with a blunted waveform. It is important to do, however, just to demonstrate that it is patent, that you have uh, the normal flow direction, and if you are evaluating the distal internal carotid artery and you find that you have a great deal of turbulent flow or disturbed flow, it may indicate that there is a more proximal lesion in the siphon, and at that point you would want to take a look at the orbit, through the orbit. The posterior cerebral artery, when you are doing these studies, you will see that these are really very close together. It only takes a tiny movement to move from anterior to posterior, and you want to make sure that you insinate the P1 segment of the PCA from its origin at the top of the basilar to the posterior communicating artery. And then at the P2 segment, it tends to wrap around the brainstem, so we can't really follow that too far. So once a strong signal is, is isolated and optimized, you decrease the depth of the sample volume to about 38 to 36 to 38, and then you begin capturing signals. Now in the st STOP protocol, we actually recorded this 38 millimeter depth as M1. This is not anatomically um, where we are in, if, you, if you compare it to Gray's anatomy, but we meant it as the first M M MCA signal that is being captured. Then you will increase the depth by two millimeter increments, record and optimize the waveform along the entire course from the middle cerebral artery to the bifurcation and you step through the entire MCA, you can see we've gone 42, 44, 46, and 48. And when you look at um, the differences in the mean flow velocity from the terminal MCA to the main trunk, you can see that the flow velocities increase. You can also use the um, imaging to do the same thing. You would visualize the vessel and step the sample volume across the entire uh, anterior and posterior circulations. So as you continue the middle cerebral artery protocol, you can see that we continue to follow the middle cerebral artery. We get to the point where the internal carotid has bifurcated into the ACA and the MCA, and because the sample volume is evaluating this area, you will get a signal that looks bidirectional. This is the most reliable intracranial landmark used to identify all other vessels. It has a strong forward flow in the MCA, a strong and a reverse flow in the ACA, and the depth must correlate with the head size. So this is again why we measure the head diameter so we know where to anticipate the um, bifurcation.
Now, as I mentioned earlier, the internal carotid artery, again, we're still using the temporal approach, and we can see that in order to insinate into this area of the ICA, we will have to angle inferiorly, and it will be a suboptimal signal. It'll be a bit of a blunt or damped waveform, and you can actually hear the gruffness of the, um, of the signal when you're doing the, your velocity evaluation. So it's a harsh, blunt audio frequency, um, but it is still valuable. It provides valuable information. So this would be the internal carotid artery. You can see that it is a lower mean velocity than we saw in the middle cerebral artery. You then increase the depth of the sample volume, uh, track it four millimeters from the bifurcation, and record an anterior cerebral artery. And because the ACAs are anatomically challenging and may go off at great angles, you can usually only routinely follow at about a depth of four to six millimeters. Document the, the flow velocity and the mean flow and the, and the direction. Comparing the middle cerebral artery to the internal carotid artery, you can see that there is a significant difference in the mean flow velocity and the volume at, of each of these vessels. Now to evaluate the posterior circulation, you are still in the temporal approach and you angle slightly to the posterior. Um, I usually just increase the depth of the sample volume to where I would expect to find the midline and that way you will get the top of the basilar. At that point you, you have gone from the bifurcation landmark to the middle of the head and looking at the top of the basilar landmark. And here, because both PCAs are originating from the top of the basilar, you're going to get another bidirectional signal. It is also important to keep in mind that the uh, mean flow velocity of the PCA is less than the MCA, but it does still have continuous diastolic flow. The superior cerebellar artery runs, artery runs parallel to the PCA, so you have to make sure that you differentiate between the two. The uh, superior cerebellar artery has a more pulsatile characteristic, um, and you can differentiate from the PCA that way. The flow velocity may increase in the presence of intracranial stenosis, and you want to track it towards the midline. Now this would be a typical posterior cerebral artery in a child with sickle cell anemia. You can see our depth is 60, and this is about midline in the normal head. They're usually their head diameters are about 120 to 125, so this is approaching the midline. So you can see you've got the ipsilateral PCA, and you're picking up a little of the contralateral because of the size of the sample volume. You can see that the mean velocity is much lower than we saw in the anterior circulation at about 97. Now, tracking the PCA to the midline is helpful in the um, st STOP protocol because, again, we wanted to make sure that we didn't misdiagnose the middle cerebral, the posterior cerebral artery as the middle cerebral artery because the overall characteristics of continuous flow during diastole are there, but you can see that the mean is much lower. The overall um, uh, display of the waveform is a much lower signal. And of course, the depth of the bifurcation or the bidirectional signal is deeper than you would expect to see at the area of the bifurcation. One last part of the study is that we look at the basilar artery for comparative purposes. Again, we want to see if this is a um, source of collateral, um, and we want to make sure that there's no intracranial disease here. It is pretty rare. So we actually turn the child on their side and tip their chin to the chest so that we can open up the, the back of the head and get access through the frame and magnum. We apply the gel to the transducer and angle the probe as if you're shining a light between the eyes. We, we actually set the default depth to 74 millimeters so that we are actually ignoring the vertebral arteries and insinating uh, just the, um, the uh, basilar artery. Now we can see that um, we're at a depth of 64, and this, this would be um, the area just as we're picking up the two vertebral arteries as we move um, to the basilar artery. But we don't normally record the vertebrals for the sickle cell study. Now this is a beautiful example of an image um, of the vertebral basilar system. You can see the opening of the frame and magnum, the two vertebral arteries, some of the branches, and then positioning the sample volume in the basilar artery. Flow is away from the transducer and nicely displayed with the, with the envelope follower, clearly defining the, um, the mean velocity. So the interpretation of TCD with sickle cell anemia, we want to have the highest recorded velocity in each intracranial artery. Um, we know that these children usually have a hematocrit of between 19 and 27 percent, um, and um, this again impacts their, their velocities. And a mean flow velocity of greater than 140 centimeter per second indicates increased cerebral flow without focal stenosis.
So the interpretation of the TCD for the clinical trials, mean flow velocity in the MCA or the ICA less than 170 is classified as normal. Mean flow velocity greater than or equal to 170 is classified as conditional and means that you will want to follow this child more carefully. Mean flow velocity greater than two, equal to or greater than 200 is abnormal and you will want to repeat this study and make sure that you have documented on two separate findings. And this is just to make sure that you haven't let the child fall asleep, that there wasn't some underlying issue where the child had a fever or with a fever, they were in sickle cell crisis and it had caused their, their physiology to change. So TCD is a standard of care for patients with sickle cell anemia. You begin studies at six months and continue through 16 years. You compare the studies to previous exams, so it is always helpful to have a baseline study. Increased velocity in the distal internal and the MCA are significant. Changes in the ACA should be monitored because we have seen that some of these patients that have high velocities in the ACA then ultimately change over in the ICA or the MCA as well. Conditional exams need to be repeated every 6 to 12 months and abnormal exams on two consecutive um, if, uh, times uh, indicate the need for treatment. Thank you for your attention. You can reach me at this email um, if you have any specific questions.